Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. Anyone who's ever played around with electronic circuits any appreciable amount has heard of the ubiquitous 555 timer integrated circuit. We've also probably cookbooked at least one project with this little chip at the heart of some sort of timing like the delayed windshield wiper control I designed and created for my dad's Ford Pinto in years past. But how does it really work? What's under the hood? This is exactly what I'm going to be talking about in this video. I will be providing a separate document which will contain all of the equations I talk about. You will find a link to this document in the description below. Now don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you find this video helpful. First, let's get a macroscopic view of its history. The 555 timer was the brainchild of the Swiss-born immigrant Hans R. Kamenzind while he worked at Signetics in 1971. His original design required nine pins, which would have forced it into the 16-pin package of the day. He was able to find a way to eliminate that ninth pin, and it was released to the public as the NE555 in 1972 in an eight pin dip package. They were an immediate hit with both industry and experimenters alike, and their use spread like wildfire. Even today, these things are everywhere. You can go to the usual distributors like DigiKey and Mouser and find multiple options to buy that are manufactured by many different companies. You can even buy them through online vendors like Amazon.com. Not only that, books have been written devoted to this chip. I did a quick check on Amazon and counted over 20 books specifically for the 555 timer. But what is under the hood of this massively useful chip? The 555 timer is actually a very simple, elegant design. Let's see what the building blocks are that they use to make this work. It consists of a voltage divider, two voltage comparators, one SR flip-flop. Well, you know, SR flip-flops are not used very often in electronic designs these days. So I want to take a few moments of time to talk about this SR flip-flop so I know that you know how they work. SR stands for Set Reset. This one has one Set Input, one Reset Input, one Not Q Output, which means that when the flip-flop is reset, this output is high, and one Not Master Reset Input, which means that it resets the flip-flop when it goes low. Now already you are probably forming a notion of how this flip-flop works. When the set input goes high, the not Q output goes low. When the reset input goes high, the not Q output goes high. Now technically, the state where both the set and the reset are high is undefined. However, some SR flip-flops will purposely favor one or the other input to break this deadlock. With this particular 555 that I am experimenting with here on the bench, it favors the set input. Now when the master reset goes low, the not Q output goes high, and the SR flip-flop becomes totally unresponsive to all other inputs. Well, what else do we have under the 555 hood? Well, we have one digital inverter. So a high on the input gives us a low on the output. And conversely, a low on the input gives us a high on the output. And we have one transistor, the discharge transistor. Now, with this understanding under our belt, how are these all put together? The voltage divider consists of three 5K ohm resistors strung between VCC and ground. This makes the voltages at the junctions of the resistors two-thirds VCC and one-third VCC. The junction of these resistors are connected to the inputs on the two voltage comparators. These act as the threshold voltages for the comparators. 
The two-thirds VCC junction is connected to the negative input of the threshold voltage comparator. The positive input of the threshold comparator is connected to the threshold pin of the chip, and the output of this comparator is connected to the reset input of the SR flip-flop. The output of this com comparator will go high if the threshold voltage is two-thirds VCC or higher. The one-third VCC junction of the voltage divider is connected to the positive input of the trigger voltage comparator. The negative input of the trigger voltage comparator is connected to the trigger pin of the chip, and the output of the comparator is connected to the set input of the SR flip-flop. The output of this comparator will go high if the trigger voltage is one-third VCC or lower. The output of the SR flip-flop is connected to the input of the digital inverter, and the output of the digital inverter is connected to the output of the chip. The output of the SR flip-flop is also connected to the discharge transistor. The emitter of the discharge transistor is connected to ground, the collector to the discharge pin of the chip. The reset input on the chip is connected to the master not reset input of the SR flip-flop. Now we have one last connection, the control voltage pin which is connected directly to the two-thirds VCC point on our voltage divider. Now that we have seen what's under the hood, how does it work? There are two basic operating modes for the 555 timer. There is the monostable mode, which means that there's only one stable state. This state is when the 555's output is low and it will always return to this state and remain there until told to do otherwise. And then there's the A-stable state. This means that there is no stable state. The output of the 555 will continuously switch between being high and low as determined by the timing resistors and capacitors. I will go over the operation of the monostable mode in detail. And rather than repeating this process for the A-stable mode, I will discuss what makes A-stable different and the same at the same time. So let's dive into monostable mode and see how this works. In the monostable mode, there is a single timing resistor, RA, and a single timing capacitor, C. How do we connect this stuff to make it monostable? Well, first of all, we take the discharge pin and connect it directly to the threshold pin, Timing resistor, RA, is connected between VCC and the threshold pin. Timing capacitor is between the threshold pin and ground. Now we need to talk about initial conditions. First, we're going to insist that the trigger input is above one-third VCC. With the trigger input above one-third VCC, the output of the trigger comparator is low. We're also going to assume that the 555 has recently been fully reset using the reset pin. This causes the output of the SR flip-flop to be high. With the output of the SR flip-flop high, two things happen. First, the output of the 555 is low. Second, the discharge transistor is turned on. This discharges a timing capacitor to zero volts. With the timing capacitor voltage at zero volts, the output of the threshold comparator is low. We are now ready to trigger the 555 and see how it works. To trigger the 555, we have to drop the voltage on the trigger pin below one-third VCC. And when the trigger input drops below one-third VCC, the output of the trigger voltage comparator goes high. When the output of the trigger voltage comparator goes high, the SR flip-flop set input also goes high. As a result, the SR flip-flop's not Q output goes low. Now, we're assuming that once the 555 is triggered, 
the trigger input is brought above the one-third VCC level again. Failure to bring this high before the end of the timing will affect the operation of the chip. I will cover this in more detail when I get to the timing foibles part of the video. With the output of the SR flip-flop being low, this does two things. It makes the 555's output go high. It turns off the discharge transistor. And with the discharge transistor turned off, the timing capacitor's voltage begins to rise as it charges through RA. When the timing capacitor's voltage reaches two-thirds VCC, the output of the threshold comparator goes high. When the output of the threshold comparator goes high, the reset input of the SR flip-flop also goes high, and the SR flip-flop is reset. Having been reset, the SR flip-flop's output goes high. This causes the output of the 555 to go low and turns on the discharge transistor. With the discharge transistor turned on, the timing capacitor is immediately discharged. When its voltage drops below two-thirds VCC, the output of the threshold comparator goes low. Eventually, the voltage on the timing capacitor goes back to zero volts. We are now back to the same initial conditions we started with, and we are ready to trigger the 555 again. The timing of the high time of the 555's output is the charge time of the capacitor from zero volts to two-thirds VCC. The way the math works, because this is a fixed percentage of the applied voltage, the timing is independent of the actual VCC. Here is the equation to calculate the high time of the 555 in monostable operation. High time is equal to 1.099 times the resistance of the timing resistor RA in ohms times the capacitance of the timing capacitor in farads. I have one very important additional note. The 555 is not re-triggerable. Well, what does that mean? It means that once triggered, the 555 will do its thing until the completion of the timing associated with the timing components. If a new trigger pulse comes along during this time, it will be completely ignored and life goes on. If the new trigger pulse extends into the time when the output should be going low, this is a bit of a different story. And I will talk about that situation when I get to the timing foible section of this video. Now, Let's take a look at how this works in A-stable operating mode. The basic operation of the 555 timer is the same between monostable and A-stable mode. But what makes A-stable mode A-stable mode? First of all, in A-stable mode, there are two timing resistors, RA and RB, and a timing capacitor, C. RA plus RB with the timing capacitor determine the high time of the 555's output. RB by itself with the timing capacitor determines the low time of the 555's output. Because the low time depends only on RB by itself, and the high time depends on both RA and RB, you can probably surmise that it is impossible to get a perfect 50% duty cycle out of the 555 timer in a standard configuration. With that said, the larger the ratio between RA and RB, the closer you can get to a 50% duty cycle. Well, what makes the setup for A-stable mode different than monostable mode? Well, in monostable mode, the trigger pin was connected to an outside source. In A-stable mode, the trigger pin is connected to the threshold pin. This means that both the threshold pin and the trigger pin see the same voltage. As with monostable mode, the timing capacitor is between the threshold pin and ground. In monostable mode, the discharge pin was connected directly to the timing capacitor. In A-stable mode, we insert RB between the discharge pin and the timing capacitor. This way, the timing capacitor discharges through RB. 
we add the other timing resistor, RA, between VCC and the discharge pin. So the charging path for the timing capacitor travels from VCC through RA and RB to the capacitor. In operation, instead of having to supply a trigger that drops below one-third VCC, the voltage on the discharging timing capacitor does this for us. There is one exception worth mentioning. Suppose that we have held the 555 in reset for an extended period of time. The discharge transistor has been turned on for the entire time, so the voltage on the timing capacitor is zero volts, which is below the one-third VCC. With the voltage on the timing capacitor below one-third VCC, the output of the trigger comparator will be high, asserting the set input of the SR flip-flop. Because of this, the output will immediately go high, the discharge transistor turns off, and the timing capacitor starts charging through RA and RB when the reset is released. When the timing capacitor voltage reaches two-thirds VCC, then the output will go low. So the first high time out of the gate of an extended reset will be longer than all of the subsequent high times because the timing capacitor has to charge from zero volts to two-thirds VCC. This time may be calculated with the following formula. High time equals 1.099 times the sum of the values of RA and RB in ohms times the capacitance in farads. From here, the trigger input will initiate a new high time when the timing capacitor's voltage drops to one-third VCC. You could say that the 555 is self-triggering and is thus a stable. So all of the subsequent high times are dictated by the time it takes the timing capacitor to charge from one-third VCC to two-thirds VCC. It doesn't have to go nearly as far, so the high time is shorter. The high time for subsequent outputs may be calculated with this equation. High time equals 0.693 times the sum of the two timing resistors in ohms RA plus RB times the value of the timing capacitor in farads. The low time is the amount of time it takes the voltage on the timing capacitor to discharge from two-thirds VCC to one-third VCC through RB. This time can be calculated using this equation. The low time equals 0.693 times the value of RB in ohms times the value of the capacitance in farads. Now the period is very simple. It's just the addition of the high time and the low time. And this works out to be 0.693 times this quantity here, which is the resistor RA in ohms, plus two times the value of the resistor RB in ohms, all times the capacitance in farads. Well, there are two pins that I have not talked about yet. There's the control voltage pin and the reset pin. Let's take a look at these next. The control voltage pin allows us to change the timing of the output waveform. It is directly connected to the two-thirds VCC point of the voltage divider, which provides the threshold voltage for the threshold voltage comparator. This pin directly controls what the timing capacitor voltage needs to be for the output to go low and the capacitor to start discharging. Because this is directly connected to a resistive voltage divider, you could simply add a resistor between VCC and this pin, or between this pin and ground to change that voltage. However, you could also apply a specific voltage which could be dynamically controlled so as to regulate a particular condition or operating mode downstream. Now remember, the control voltage directly determines that time in the timing capacitor's charging curve where the output goes low. However, 
because the voltage at which the output is triggered to go high again in a stable mode is always one half of this control voltage, the time which the output remains low is pretty much fixed regardless of the control voltage and is uniquely determined by the values of the timing resistors and capacitors. So we can vary the amount of time the output is high by varying the voltage on the control pin. But the time the output is low is fixed in place by the hardware chosen. The higher voltage on the control voltage pin will yield a longer high time because the capacitor has to charge to a higher voltage before the 555 will discharge it. Conversely, a lower voltage on the control voltage pin will yield a shorter high time because the capacitor has to charge to a lower voltage before the 555 will discharge it. Now for those who need to determine the actual effects of the control voltage on the high time, I have provided the requisite equations in a document for you. You will find the link to this document in the description of this video. The equations provided are for both monostable and astable operating modes and allow you to calculate the high time given a particular control voltage or to calculate the required control voltage to achieve a given high time. Now, on to the reset pin. First of all, when we talk about the reset pin, the pin is labeled simply reset, which is kind of a misnomer in the more modern pin labeling nomenclature. The reason why I say this is because the chip is reset when this pin is pulled low, making it actually a negative logic input. So technically, it is a not reset input. Second of all, the reset pin is a hard reset. Now, that is to say that regardless of the state of other control pins, such as threshold or trigger, the operation of the 555 comes to a screeching halt when it is asserted. So what happens when the reset pin is asserted? Well, first of all, the output goes low immediately. Second of all, the 555 is going to ignore all other control inputs. Thirdly, the timing capacitor is being discharged through the operation of the discharge pin of the 555. Now, the amount of time it will take the timing capacitor to completely discharge to zero volts depends on the initial voltage on the capacitor and the mode of operation of the 555 because that determines the discharge path. It is up to the designer to determine the time necessary for the 555 and its associated circuitry to be completely brought back to a known state when the reset pin is asserted. Now we can go on to the timing foibles of the 555. The 555 timer has a few timing foibles that we need to talk about. To completely understand the timing foibles of the 555, you have to remember that the timing of the 555 is totally dependent on the voltage across the timing capacitor. In order to get consistent and predictable timing, the designer has to be sure that the timing capacitor is allowed to completely charge and discharge to a known and consistent level. Let's take, for example, a design that has a 555 operating in a stable mode when we reset it in mid-operation using the reset pin. Now, we have some sort of circuitry in control of the reset pin. We're powering the chip with 5 volts. And then we have the following timing components. We have RA equal to 1K. We have RB equal to 10K, and the timing capacitor is 10 microfarad. So according to the equations, the high time should be 76.23 milliseconds. The low time should be 69.3 milliseconds. And the overall period should be 145.53 milliseconds. Now suppose the reset is asserted 
50 milliseconds into the normal high state. The output will immediately go low, shortening the normal high time to 50 milliseconds. At the time that the reset is asserted, the timing capacitor voltage is sitting at 2.88 volts. Now that the 555 is reset, the output is low and will remain low until such time as the timing capacitor voltage drops below one third VCC or 1.667 volts. The discharge transistor is turned on. The capacitor is discharging through the 10K RB resistor. The discharge time to one third VCC will take 55.1 milliseconds. So the reset is asserted and released and the output of the 555 goes low with the reset and will remain low for 55.1 milliseconds, at which time it will resume normal operation. It does not immediately resume normal operation when the reset is released, and the time associated with this delay has everything to do with the voltage present on the timing capacitor at the time of the reset and the operating mode of the 555. Another timing foible you need to be aware of with the 555 has to do with the trigger pin when used in monostable operation. So let's back up a little bit. At the heart of the 555 lay the SR flip-flop. The trigger pin feeds the trigger voltage comparator feeds the set input of the SR flip-flop. If the trigger pin is held below one-third VCC, the output of the comparator and thus the set input pin of the SR flip-flop is being asserted. Meanwhile, the timing capacitor is charging and may reach a voltage above the two-thirds VCC level, causing the output of the threshold voltage comparator to also be asserted, which asserts the reset input of the SR flip-flop. Now, normally, Having both the set and reset inputs of the SR flip-flop asserted is considered an indeterminate state. However, at least with the particular 555 device I'm working with here, they chose to favor the set input. This means that as long as the trigger input is held below one-third VCC, the output of the 555 will remain high. So, if the timing components are set for, let's say, a 50 millisecond high time, and we apply a 75 millisecond trigger pulse, the output will remain high for 75 milliseconds and immediately go low when we release the trigger input. So, what has happened to the voltage in the timing capacitor during this extra 25 milliseconds? Well, it is charged well above the two-thirds VCC level, meaning that the discharge time will be greater. The good news is, in monostable mode, it doesn't have to discharge through a resistor, so that difference is probably not going to be too significant. So there we have it, the 555 timer. It is a very elegant design, and even after almost 50 years in the market, it remains very popular and very useful. Hopefully this video has helped you to gain a greater understanding of how it works so that you can create your own awesome designs using this chip. If you have found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots!